our, um, <clears throat> our first webinar Wednesday of uh, the new year. We're excited to see um, all of you, some familiar and not familiar faces uh, to join us today. And looking forward to a, um, a very engaging and, and timely talk from Professor Randy Iden. I'm gonna quickly get out of the way here and um, introduce Professor Iden and, <clears throat> and thank him in advance for taking the time to be with us today. Um, many of you know uh, Randy from your time as students. Um, Randy is currently the faculty director of the MSc program but uh, has a long and storied history with, with us um, uh, for, for many, many years. But um, uh, <clears throat> early on, uh, Randy earned a bachelor's in history from uh, Haverford College, went on to get a JD from University of Pennsylvania Law School, is an MSc alum, does have his master's in communication from uh, here at Northwestern, as well as a PhD in communication studies with a program in uh, rhetoric and public culture has been teaching with the MSC program since 2008. And uh, I'm excited to, to hear this talk. This is gonna be a new one for me even. So I'm gonna hand it over and get out of the way. Um, Randy, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Toby. And it's great to see um, everyone here today. Um, I hope um, some of you had a chance to see some of the inaugural festivities, which um, were, were, were great. And I'm gonna play off of that a little bit as well as the fact that we had Martin Luther King Day um, this week. Um, some of you have uh, taken my class in strategic communication before and may be concerned that uh, you're just going to uh, get a repeat. And I've tried to, to, to jump off of that a little bit and, and talk in a, in a different direction. Um, when I get to the end, um, I'll be happy to, to take questions. I'm not great at um, following the chat while I'm trying to talk. So Toby's gonna keep track of the questions and we'll make sure that they all get um, answered at the end. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. That may well be the... Um, phrase of 2020, right? Either you're on mute or let me share my screen. Okay, so you should all be able to see um, <clears throat> the screen at this point. And I will acknowledge right up front that I stole my format of my title from um, Sarah Connor, the great uh, humorist who emerged in this year. Um, who titled a lot of her videos with a how-to. And so this discussion today is about mission and mission statements, um, but I wanna keep the idea of the mission um, itself up front. All right, so I know we have a couple of people I noticed on here who are not in the United States. Annalise, I, know, I see you for sure. Um, so this takes a little bit, a tiny bit of American history in order to get us started. Um, in November of 1863, during the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln went to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to dedicate a cemetery that was being built for the dead who had died in the battle several months earlier. Um, and, and many of the bodies were still laying on the field several months later. And Lincoln's speech started with a phrase that almost every American student of history knows, and I would venture that a lot of people um, who've studied American history who aren't American know as well, which is four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Um, and the beginning of that speech, four score and seven years ago, is an odd way of talking about time. Um, it would have been odd to Lincoln's audience too, although most of Lincoln's audience would have recognized what a score was because it's used in the Bible and a score is 20 years. And so four score and seven years was Lincoln's somewhat fancy rhetorical oratorical way of saying 87 years ago. But I will contend that he said four score and seven years ago because he was naturally uh, a, a speaker who knew how to make choices, but also because he wanted to let people ruminate, do the math to figure out what that meant. Because if we're talking four score and seven years ago from 1863, 
we get to 1776. And that's not a surprise. Everybody knows that that's what was going on um, 87 years before that, the Declaration of Independence had been signed in Philadelphia. But you also may not know that the country that Lincoln was speaking to had not been formed in 1776. At that time, the, the American colonies were still part of Britain. They were declaring their independence. The war lasted until 1783. And soon after that, the um, Americans passed something called the Articles of Confederation to bind the colonies together. And it wasn't until 1789 that the Constitution of the United States was ratified and the nation that Lincoln's talking about in the speech was actually brought into being. And so the question is, what's Lincoln doing um, when he asks his audience in 1863 to think about the Declaration of Independence instead of the Constitution? Remember that the Constitution had failed. It failed to hold the country together. Lincoln went to war to save that constitution, but it was clear that a constitution which had slavery built into it, um, that had the three-fifths compromise that most of you know about, which counted the slaves in the South as three-fifths of a person for the purposes of determining how many um, representatives a, a state got. Um, there were lots of things in that constitution that had caused the country to come apart. So what's Lincoln directing his audience to think about in 1863? He's resetting the mission of the country. He's focusing the mission now, instead of on the Declaration of Independence, or, I'm sorry, on the Constitution. And the Constitution isn't a mission statement. It's, it's more of an operating document or a, um, <clears throat> set of instructions for exactly how to run the country. But the Constitution does have a mission statement in it, which is the preamble. We, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union. And that is really the mission statement that Lincoln skips past in order to get to this mission statement that you can see on the side here. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed with their creator by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so what Lincoln does in that very short speech in a very neat way is to encourage his audience to think of the mission statement that got us going in the first place, the Declaration of Independence, as the set of instructions, the words, the ideas that are going to pull us back together after the Civil War. In 1863, even though the war is still going on, the Battle of Gettysburg had been sort of a turning point and it had become clear that the North was going to win. And so now the question was, are we going to be able to get the country back together? And that's what he goes on to talk about in the Declaration of Independence. And in thinking about talking about mission statements, this idea often comes to me because it shows us the idea of mission statements, mission words as living texts that need to be rhetorically analyzed, revitalized, and used if they're going to have any meaning. So let's transition now and talk about what you thought you came to hear, which was organizational mission st statements. And this, this uh, erudite fellow over here is Peter Drucker. Um, he was a, a management consultant and a, a professor um, who's given credit for rethinking, revitalizing the American world um, business organization, um, particularly the idea of what management was. And he's really the first person from an academic sense who takes up this issue of mission statements. Um, it's not that before the 70s when he started to talk about this, there was no such thing as mission statements. Um, some organizations had them. Um, Johnson & Johnson is one that had a mission statement starting in the 40s. Um, family businesses often had statements of, of family purpose and so forth. But 
What Drucker ended up saying was that the mission is a really important piece of um, uh, important text for any organization to have because it answers the question, what is our business? That without a mission statement, you as the manager of the business and your stakeholders don't necessarily know what the purpose of that organization is for. There is a whole line of academic thought um, that talks about why do we have business firms? What are they supposed to do? What size should they be? When do they function best? And what Drucker came up with was the idea that you needed to have a mission to hold the organization together and that a manager, um, senior manager or middle manager, needs to be able to understand what that mission is in order to go about the daily business of running that organization. It's important to keep that in mind. So what does a mission statement look like? Um, I just pulled an example from some small um, obscure company that I found. Um, this is Amazon's um, mission. It, if I asked you to guess, you might've said that their mission was to dominate the world, um, to leave no stone unturned in taking your money from you or whatever. Um, but what you see here is that they have a statement that says it's their goal to be earth <laughs> most customer centric company where customers can find and discover anything they might want to buy online. And most of that's pretty, not very exciting. Um, the neologism of customer centric is the place where you really zero in on that mission statement. And what that tells you is that from the perspective of this mission, everything that Amazon does is supposed to be related to its customers. Um, again, you should, you can and should dispute this. There's, there's lots of reasons um, that this would be something that we could discuss at great length. But the point is, this is what a mission statement looks like. So what are the components of what a mission statement um, should be. There are lots of different kinds of mission statements, um, but this is my general definition of what a mission statement should be. Number one, it should be clear and concise. Um, it doesn't have to be eloquent necessarily. Um, we, we love historically mission statements that are beautifully read and we like to be able to show them and um, use them as ornament, but that's not really the important thing. The important thing is that it can be understood um, and that it's not endless, it doesn't go on and on. It needs to be short enough that it actually counts as a statement. So it's a clear and concise statement of the organization's reason for being, it's raison d'etre. Um, why does this organization exist? Um, why should it be here? There can be lots of reasons for that. And one example of this, I mentioned already family businesses and often family business mission statements emerge from the family. So the, the business is there to provide for the family, to support the family, to give the family um, an opportunity for uh, material wealth or for opportunity or um, things like that. Um, in other cases, the organization's reason for being um, can be to serve a charitable purpose. Um, one of the things that we know is that not just business organizations have mission statements. Nonprofit organizations, um, clubs, um, informal organizations often have mission statements. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But the mission statement needs to express the reason that this organization should exist. Why is it worth preserving? Um, it should be addressed to stakeholders and the public. And depending on how you define the word stakeholders, that may include um, the public. I'm breaking it out here to just make sure that we, we understand that um, a mission statement should be intended to be seen by other people. It 
essentially functions as a name tag that would allow people to know who you are. It's really important for stakeholders that they should see themselves um, named in the statement. One of the things that you would use to test whether a mission statement is a good statement is to have stakeholders read it and to see whether they recognize themselves in that statement. Do they hear themselves called out to? Do they feel that they understand the purpose, the reason for being um, in a way that speaks to them, that, that makes sense to them? Um, for the public, it may sometimes be that they don't necessarily feel addressed unless like in the Amazon statement, they're supposed to feel addressed. So they're supposed to think if I want a place that will take care of me, if I want a place where I can find anything that's available online, I can go to Amazon. Um, they don't necessarily have to feel um, addressed, named in it, but they should feel addressed. One of the things, and we'll talk about this in a bit, but one of the things that a lot of mission statements fail to do is to call out to internal stakeholders. Um, many cases, the mission statement is written from the standpoint of shareholders, um, senior managers, the people who are making decisions for the organization, and in, in many cases, the customers. And a lot of times people understand the importance of the customer or the service population of an organization in the mission statement. But the one group that is most consistently left out of mission statements is the internal stakeholder. And you can tell this if you go to many organizations, show them the mission statement of their organization, you'll find them laughing um, at, the, at the mission statement because it may be directly opposed to the way that they imagine themselves being seen by the organization. Um, and then finally, the mission statement focuses the organization, sorry, uh, keep having to move the faces around here. Um, <clears throat> focus the organization, expresses its key values and distinguishes it from others. And it doesn't have to be all three of these, although I would recommend that it would be. It absolutely has to be number one. It has to focus the organization. Um, I might argue that whether you mean to or not, the mission statement exposes your key values for better or for worse. So it makes sense that you should think about it um, and, and make sure that you're looking at the values, but sometimes the values are hidden. And then the idea that it distinguishes it from others uh, again, this is really important to a for-profit competitive organization or a competitive nonprofit organization that's really tr trying to compete for a particular market segment in some way um, or other. But there's an interesting philosophical discussion about whether an organization needs to exist if there's other organizations that can do exactly what it does. And so distinguishing your organization and why does it need to exist as a specific organization is an important question that you wanna um, answer in your mission statement. So it doesn't sound like it's that hard to do. You only got four things to do. Um, you should be able to put together your mission statement um, pretty easily. I noticed in one of the um, questions that someone had written um, as part of the registration they asked for the difference between the mission statement and the vision statement. Um, and I use mission statement as kind of a catch-all uh, term to describe capturing the mission, the reason that the organization exists and what it's trying to do. But we often do make a distinction between a mission statement and a vision statement. And the distinction that I would make is that a mission statement is, um, sorry. Mission statement is um, the statement of purpose and values. Um, what are we? 
what is this organization? What is it supposed to be doing? And a vision statement is an aspirational statement of the future of the business. What we could be, what are we gonna grow up to be? Um, <clears throat> you need a mission statement. Um, a vision statement is a useful thing to discuss. Um, in, in many cases, the actual discussion of the vision statement is more important than the actual statement because what the vision statement allows you to do is to think about where you're going. If everything works out, if all of your dreams come true, if you could change the things that you want to change, what would you end up um, being? Uh, it's, it's important to recognize what your dream is in this sense. Um, the vision statement functions as an inspirational device. It's something that you can use to let people know what they're working towards. It also really interestingly can be a limiting device because the vision statement can help you determine when you're moving in a direction that is going um, in a direction different than what your vision is. Uh, and so if you have some proposal, some opportunity, something that you wanna take on and you look at that and you say, well, if we took this on and it came true, would this still be within our vision statement? It doesn't mean that you can't do it, but it might mean that you have to change your vision statement if that's the direction that you want to go in. So the mission statement is something that helps us on a daily basis understand what are we getting up in the morning to do? What are, what's our important work? Um, who are we? How do we define ourselves? The vision statement looks to the future defines the possibilities that we're aiming towards. Um, yeah, those of you who know me, um, and Toby mentioned that my degree was in rhetoric, um, and that may or may not mean anything to you, um, but what I think about now when I try to think about what a mission um, statement is, is I want to know what the rhetorical purpose is. And let me explain what I mean by the rhetorical um, purpose. Rhetoric is the study of the way a lot of people would say that language engages persuasion. So rhetoric is about learning how to persuade somebody. Uh, other theorists of rhetoric see rhetoric as more about identity that if you recognize the word someone saying, that you may recognize them as having a, the same relationship to a certain concept as you do. If you recognize that, that engages the natural human desire to form groups. And so in that sense, what rhetoric is really about is bringing people together. And so to me, the rhetorical purpose, the underlying reason that we have a mission statement is to define the shared identity of an organization in a way that allows stakeholders to understand what it means to belong. So the mission statement is why, this is why I say it's so important that stakeholders and particularly internal stakeholders recognize themselves in the mission statement because the mission statement ends up being the definition of the organization. We all know that human beings function best in groups. We accomplish the most in groups. We also all know that we're not hive creatures. We don't have a natural evolutionary bond to each other that allows us to easily form shared endeavors. So what do we need in order to form a shared endeavor? We need communication, we need language. And that's what language evolves to do, um, is that it gives us an understanding of, of who we are. It's one of the reasons why, if you look at a lot of languages, um, the word that the language will use for itself, for its society, its community, its country, if you will, is often the same word as the word for the people. That we see ourselves um, and the people who speak our language as having something that we share in common. And as the Greeks would say, that we see everybody else as barbarians. And the word barbarian comes from the fact that to the Greeks, every other language sounded just like bar, 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 bar. So 
the idea of being inside or outside is really important. And as human beings, we have the possibility to be simultaneously inside lots of different organizations um, and inside some in ways that are different than being inside to others. So what we get to with the mission statement is it's designed to help us to understand what is the group that we are a part of. What does it mean to be a part of that group? What is the standard for admission? Um, what rites and rituals do we have to enact to be a member in good standing in that organization? Um, what does this get us if we do it? Where do we, um, where does this elevate us as an individual to be part of this organization? This is something that we are all negotiating all the time without really thinking about it when you think about where you belong, where you're most comfortable, where you feel like you can do the most good and so forth. And what the mission statement allows us to do is to think about um, what that means. And once we draft the mission statement, I ruined my joke by stepping ahead here, but in most organizations, we write a mission statement and we put it on the shelf. We put it in a drawer, maybe we frame it. Um, the one place that it always ends up in today's world is on the least used part of the website, right? So you go to a website for any organization and you're usually going there to find out what kind of products that they sell or whether they might have a job for you or, um, whether you should contribute money to them or whatever. Um, and if you go to almost any one of those websites, there's going to be a tab on the left-hand side that says about the organization. And someplace down in that pile of crap, you're going to find a mission statement. Um, in many cases, if you today go and look at the mission statement for an organization, you're going to be the first person to have looked at that mission statement in months. Um, it's just like uh, the, the, the joke that they always make about uh, people's uh, dissertations, that uh, if you put your dissertation on the, on the shelf in the library, you can stick a $20 bill inside of it and come back in 10 years and the $20 bill will still be there. Um, I hope that that doesn't send a lot of people off to the library to start um, looking through dissertations for money. But um, that's the, the same fate that a mission statement usually ends up um, suffering is that it is designed, it's often written by professionals at the bequest of management, it is polished, it is debated, it is often negotiated into um, a watered down version of what it was intended to be, and then it gets put on the shelf. We want to try to figure out how not to do that, because the importance of the mission statement is not in the writing of the mission statement. The importance of the mission statement is in the living of the mission statement, the enacting of the mission statement. So the question that we have is, what can we do to make a mission statement a tool we can use? I really don't know what this tool is that I took a picture of here. Um, it doesn't look like a tool I could use, but um, we're gonna to try to make our mission statement something that is useful to us. So first step, and this is one of the hardest ones for lots of organizations. If you've ever worked on drafting a mission statement for your organization, um, they don't want you to be honest. They want it to sound good. They want the organization to be, um, to sound like they hope they can be um, perceived. They want, what they would wish to be in a perfect world. Um, but the first step in creating a mission statement that you can use is to be honest with the purpose of that mission statement. Honesty doesn't mean, and you won't see a lot of mission statements that are aware of their faults consciously. So you don't see very many mission statements that start off with, we are terrible managers of people, but we have a really good product. 
Um, so you don't, you don't see that, but what you shouldn't see or what you hope to avoid in creating a mission statement is the mission statement that says, our organization is like a family. Every one of our team members is an important part of this organization and we value their input. If that's true, that's an excellent point for your mission statement, but it's not true for a lot of organizations in any meaningful way. And to put it in becomes something um, of a joke at the very beginning. It means that your mission statement isn't going to have any usefulness. So in trying to find a mission statement, you do the same thing that you do when you're writing a resume ethically, is that you try to find the best way to say who you really are. I understand that there may be some of you chuckling to yourself as you think about things you may have put on resumes in the past or things that you've read on resumes that have come across your desk uh, and so forth. Um, but the goal here when you're writing a resume is to develop a, a picture of the best version of you, the, the person that you actually can be in the best of circumstances, the person that you have been at your best. Um, and there's an internet meme that goes around of various different kinds of videos under the heading, what happens when you lie on your resume. My favorite one is, is one where there's a, a dog trying to herd sheep that clearly doesn't know what it's doing and is running all around with the sheep and the sheep are going in all different directions. And um, you know that's, that's an example of when you've lied on your resume. Um, it's an example of when you lie on your mission statement, the same thing uh, happens is that you get a disconnect between what the mission statement says and what's really happening. So find a way to be honest, look at the things that are really valuable about your organization. What is the main goal that you have? What are the things that you do better than somebody else and start to work those into the mission statement. So be honest about what you actually have to offer. Second, also very difficult for lots of organizations, engage your stakeholders in the creation and adoption of the mission statement. Um, the language that you use is going to work better if it's language that is authentic um, in many cases, if you're a consultant asked to write a mission statement, if you're a PR person asked to write a mission statement, if you're a strategy manager asked to write a mission statement, you may not be in touch with the language that's authentic to that organization. And so finding ways to engage the stakeholders, um, and you clearly don't want to give over the process to the stakeholders in, in most cases. It, it, some are, it, it actually works in smaller and particularly nonprofit organizations um, or community-based organizations to give over that process. But in a business organization, you're not gonna give over the process to somebody else, but you want to get their input. And there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, the easiest way to conceptualize would be a survey, but there's other ways to do it where you don't even have to tip your hand, where you can just simply go out and start to ask people for what do they think are the best things about working at this organization or what words come to their mind when they think about their organization and start to use those in the way in how you put your uh, statement together. Again, the goal is that once the mission statement is created, people will recognize themselves. The fancy word for that is to be interpolated, to be called out by the mission statement. All right. Third, also difficult. These are all difficult, it turns out. Let the words speak through action. What do I mean by that? The mission statement works best if the mission statement is a living document. And that means that as much as possible, the mission statement is present as you make decisions, as you act. And so this is something that um, religious folks will recognize as what you're asked to do in many cases by your religion, which is to incorporate 
the principles of the religion through the Bible or the Quran or any other text, and then to have those words be present in the way that you act. And one of the best ways for them to be present is to actually use the words. And so if the word is um, that's in your mission statement is respect, then you should use the word respect and allow that to guide your action. If the word respect is in your mission statement and it becomes very clear that you find it hard to use respect in the way that you do your job, you have a disconnect. You're not going to be empowered by the mission statement. You're at the very best going to think of the mission statement as irrelevant fluff. At the worst, you're going to actually be given um, the wrong message. You're going to be discouraged and depressed by the, the disconnect between the mission statement and the way that your life works. Also difficult, let the mission evolve. Um, when you think about who you are as an individual and your own in individual goals, um, people who talk about these things, people who are um, life coaches or personal counselors um, will often tell you to review your goals periodically. Um, make sure that they're still what you want um, to go through that process. And the same thing happens with organizations. Um, one of the challenges of organizations that have been around for a long time is the we often feel that the tradition, the fact that it's old, has been around for a period of time, is an advantage, it's something we want to brag about, it's something that we um, care very deeply about. But there's lots of times where organizations that have been around for a long time have evolved to the point where some of those original values don't really make that much sense anymore. And you can find ways to still honor the tradition, but let the mission change. And there are some really interesting um, companies out there that have started in one field and moved to another. IBM is a, a great example of one that's had to um, reinvent itself time and time again. Um, although there's still a core of the idea of business technology that's involved in what IBM does, it's culture, its mission has, has turned um, so that it's almost unrecognizable to what somebody working at IBM in say the late 40s or early 50s would, would be able to recognize. As the mission evolves, refresh the statement. Again, one of the things that we sometimes like about our mission statement is our mission statement is like the tchotchkes in our cabinet. Um, they don't change. Um, they're, they're things that we have always had. But a good mission statement is one that we have a chance to periodically look at, to endorse. Um, some organizations will actually um, use the mission statement um, as something that has to be adopted periodically by the members. When I went to college, um, we had an honor code. Um, the honor code functioned to a certain extent as a mission statement of the college. It was The college was formed by Quakers and it still had Quaker roots. And every single year it was required that there be a plenary, a, a gathering, where the honor code was adopted. And unless it was adopted, the principles of the honor code, and there were lots of privileges that came from having an honor code, they fell out of operation. And so this idea of being able to come back to that statement, um, not just at the individual level, not certainly just at the CEO level, but at an organizational level, and change to what you are now to keep your statement fresh is an important part of making this a tool that you can use. And when you refresh the statement, you need to re-engage the stakeholders. And that's, of course, what I'm saying that Lincoln was doing in the Gettysburg Address was he was preparing his stakeholders to take on the work of reforming the nation that had been torn in two. And that's something that takes a lot of courage to do when you have an organization that has been through turmoil and change, 
um, and to try to get your stakeholders to understand what it is that they should continue to care about. <clears throat> okay, and this was also a question, I, I had this in before I read the question, but I was glad to see the question show up. Um, somebody asked, what can you do to get your management to pay attention to the mission statement when they seem to be ignoring what's, what the mission statement says? This is, I think, one of the best lessons for how to use a mission statement and what a mission statement or any other kinds of um, documents that an organization creates around itself is that people and organizations want to sound good. They want to see the best view of themselves. And when they write their biography, when they write their autobiography, they write their, their organizing um, texts, they often use language that is sounds really good, but we're not really sure if they're committed to it. And the perfect example is the language that I showed you before that said, all men are created equal and endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights. We know that we as a country and other countries as well have continually struggled to live up to our mission statement. We fail all the time. Um, we fail quietly and embarrassingly, and we fail blatantly and without concern for the differences between the way we're acting and what our values and ideals are. And so in honor of Martin Luther King Day, um, in honor of Inauguration Day that is perhaps fraught um, with, with more relief or, or more celebration than it ordinarily would be, um, we look to the lessons of how do we use the mission statement language as counter leverage. Counter leverage means you hold the organization to, you hold them to what they've said they were going to do. And one of the best examples of this comes from Martin Luther King's 1963 speech um, at the March to Washington. And I wanna go through some of this language again to show you exactly how this works because this is a, a technique that you can use in your own organizations. You start with what they have already said and you use those words as evidence. So look what Martin Luther King says just to start here. Five score years ago, Clearly, he's echoing the four score and seven years that Abraham Lincoln talked about. But now it's five score years. If you can do the math in your head, that's 100 years. 100 years after Lincoln spoke, 1963, um, a great America in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. That was actually signed in January of 1863. This momentous decree came as a great beacon of light, beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. And then goes on to say how that hasn't actually been followed through on. And he says, in a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring the sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which came back marked insufficient funds. 
And so what you see here is that Martin Luther King is able to create a metaphor that shows that the words that were in the Declaration of Independence were not just words, they were actually the same thing as a promise, a promise that can be honored in business, something that people that like law and order can understand. You'll also see that he now includes the Constitution and not just the Declaration of Independence, where Lincoln was moving away from the Constitution that had failed. King is able to go back to the Constitution because the Constitution's been fixed. The Constitution was fixed by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which attempted to eliminate the failures of that original Constitution. And of course, 100 years later, those amendments and the promises that they made had also been refused. So what I will ask you to think of today is that if you have the chance to create a mission statement, take the steps that I talked about, be honest, listen to your stakeholders, be willing to refresh it, make it a living document, use those words in your actions. If you're someone in an organization who doesn't have that power, the principle of counter leverage allows you to use the language that other people use aspirationally to fight for the truth of those words and to make your organization live up to its mission. Thank you very much. I am available for questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been one last thing to do before I quit is that I, um, was asked by a company out of the blue to comment on their mission statement. And so I put it in here um, and I'm not going to talk about it at this point, but um, if you want to look at this and ask the same questions that we talked about before, this is a good exercise in trying to figure out how a mission statement should work. Because here's one where they stretched it out with an, and even added two additional categories. Um, they've, they've come up with some, some things, but they managed to say very little in a lot of um, space. And so this is something that we, uh, at another time, I'll talk to you, you more about. But the, the goal is of the exercise is to take whatever mission statement you have to work with it, go through it, look to find the truth of it, um, look to find the language that you see that's going to be most challenging. And so in this case, if you see, we bring smiles with delicious food. Um, one of the things that you might imagine is that people that work at that company may not smile as much as the customers that they're talking to. And so that's a perfect place for you as somebody who wants to make changes to latch on to and make the organization live up to its, its own words. All right. So with that, I will say thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Randy. Uh, we're happy to take any questions. You can enter them into the chat or uh, raise your hand as Leo has done, and we'll unmute you here. But uh, Leo, go ahead. Hi, Randy. Uh, excellent uh, lecture. Really appreciated it. Um, Thanks, Leo. I'm a proud member of the MSC Pioneers, class of 86, the very first graduating class. And Wish I could take it all over again without having to, yeah. do, without having to do all the papers. But uh, <laughs> I digress. Uh, I work with nonprofits. I have for 40 years and have been through a lot of mission revisions and reviews. And to say it could be tedious would be an understatement, especially uh, when you have uh, groups of people, boards, you know, constituents, uh, employees. And uh, the hardest thing is wordsmithing with a group. How, how do you recommend truncating that process? So what, what and, and Toby will know because we went through this process together that um, it wasn't any easier for us to try to do it. Um, there's, there's two things. One is um, that your managers um, who ask you to do that to go through that process are actually often looking for a product. So they want something that sounds good, sounds professional, is eloquent and, and so forth and so on. And my argument is that that's actually less valuable than the honesty of the discussion that you have 
Um, and so the, the wordsmithing part of it is, is definitely a challenge because as you begin to define the terms, you will often water down the meaning. You will awful, often make it a less important statement than it was. Um, I think that the advice is as much as possible to keep the argument on the values, on the things that you want. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's advisable to delegate the actual writing of the statement um, to an individual. That is exactly, as you know, probably, what happened with the Declaration of Independence, is that the, the framers, the, the people who are interested in this, discussed all the concepts, and then they sent Thomas Jefferson to write it. Um, he wrote it, there were some changes that were made, there were some suggestions, there were some you know, concerns, but that I think that process actually works better than trying to group write anything. Um, is that if you if you get someone who can take the concepts, put it down on paper, and then as much as possible try to get people to see that the um, validity of the discussion exists in the document. Thank you. Does that help? Very much so. Thank Good. You. Um, we have another question in the chat, and then we'll get to Kat. Um, uh, Elizabeth asks, is there an elegant and effective way to raise concerns about an outdated mission statement? Um, that's, this particular example sounds like there's a recently adopted strategic plan for the organization that doesn't line up with maybe an outdated or, or old mission statement. How do you tell your boss that, that they're wrong and moving in the wrong direction? Um, so depending on the size of organizations, a lot of times these things happen in different silos um, so that the person who's working on the strategic plan may not be aware of the mission statement. Um, there are plenty of people out there who see mission statements as nothing but decoration and so that they aren't um, very valuable. My advice for how you talk to your manager about that is you bring it to them as something that will increase the chances that the strategic plan works. So what you say is this strategic plan is going to work better. I think one of the, the, the beauties of talking to an MSC audience of those of you who actually have been in or are in the MSC audience is that every single one of you um, has had the experience of learning from Mike Roloff. And you know this is something that, that Mike Roloff is very strong in saying that strategic plans and change initiatives often fail because the people who write them don't have any connection to what's really going on in the organization. And so my sense would be you come to the manager to say, as part of this strategic plan, we need to make sure that um, we have updated all of the documents that are gonna make us seem as consistent, that we're gonna to have to spread this through our stakeholders because that when you have strategic initiatives, we often don't share those with the stakeholders either. But that this is a process that it that we can actually give life to the strategic plan by using it as a way to um, re-engage, re-energize, refresh the mission statement. Perfect. Always, when, when, from a persuasive standpoint, always try to make it seem like you're helping the person that you're suggesting it to. You're making it better for, for them. Um, Kat, go ahead. Hi. So first of all, I wanted to say thank you for the concept of counter leverage. I'm a big word nerd and to know that I'm not just like splitting hairs and looking at this and being a crazy person is super empowering. So thank you. Um, I also wanted to get your thoughts on um, absolutes in, in a mission statement. Um, mm -hmm. I saw in the, in the farmer's foods or the, the example that you gave us the always do what's right at the bottom of the culture statement. And I've yep. worked for several companies that have, you know, their vision and their mission is to be the best blankety blanket, whatever it is they're doing. Um, and that for me kind of reading it and emotionally always comes up a little short. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on, on whether or not you feel that's effective and how to modify. Um, yeah, that's a that's a huge problem. You know, we as I said, in, my my analogy to the resume um, is the same thing. Is um, the uh, Elvis Costello lyric that I always remember is um, once he glanced at the jackets of some paperbacks, now he's read every one, and we do that on um, 
you know, in our resume, we do that in our mission statement is we take the things that we wish were true and we assert them um, as, as true. Um, as a word nerd, um, you know, it would be my desire to, to make language like that aspirational. We try to do our best. Whenever possible, we do the right thing. Um, you know, I guess I wouldn't say that, but that, um, <laughs> but, but, but the idea that, you know, that you understand the humanity of that. The other um, point is to think about um, those kinds of statements as having, because we're human beings, having that room, wiggle, wiggle room there. Um, you know, that even the best organizations will screw up sometimes, even the best people will screw up sometimes. And so I think that you have to be patient as a stakeholder with the organization for not living up to what it does perfectly every time. This is, you know, this is the great argument that we have as a country is to what degree can we expect the language, the aspirational language of our founding documents to work every single day. And we certainly should try to hold our organizations to what they say. We should certainly try to write things that we can live up to, but we understand that there's some wiggle room um, that's necessary. And that's the point, you know, what we're always trying to engage. And I think that, you know, that if you say that our goal is to do the right thing in every circumstance, that opens up a really interesting discussion of, are we trying to do that in this case? And, um, and there's lots of times where just by mentioning the mission documents, you can change the view of somebody who's willing to let well enough be well enough. So we've got one last question before we sign off. Um, uh, the question is, to what extent can one upgrade or refresh their mission statement um, without weakening previous goals or values? Is there, is there this, it, it seems to be a fine line of without, you know, uh, putting the, the previous administration or whatever it is to, to shame by making changes in, in the future mission. How do you do yeah, that? No, that's, that's, I mean, that is, I would argue that's one of the most important challenges of any ongoing organization. So organizations have a lifespan. Um, they don't need to live forever. There are times when organizations in the form that they're in, um, don't have anything left to do anymore. The buggy whip companies that have not um, become something different. Um, and so the, the easy way of saying that, and I know it's somewhat trite to do this, is that you save the best of the past and invigorate it um, in what you're doing now. Um, I think that in most cases, there are components of those old values that you do wanna keep. And that that's where you, um, you say, look, this is the thing that we were really best at. This is the thing that we really cared the most about. But now we're going to be moving in a, in a different direction. Um, so I, the, you will see that there's in the literature of mission statements, of which there is a huge amount written, um, that one of the main concepts is to always be positive in a mission statement. And I agree with that. So the way to do that is to um, to try to positively look at. So for example, if you have an organization that has a, has a mission that they, they, we always develop our, the best man for the job. Um, and now what you wanna say is, um, whoa, we don't want that same man anymore. Um, you still wanna develop people the best way possible. And you can now build off that to say that one of the things that we recognize in this organization now is that the best person for the job comes in lots of different um, shapes. And that, that that now allows you to leverage um, what, you've, what you've done before. It always, you know, always trying to look for what's the best of the old combined with where you wanna go, getting rid of that dead wood and, and baggage that you don't want with you. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much to Randy for the time today. Uh, it, it was very interesting. A number of comments through the chat, uh, Randy talking about how um, timely this is to so many uh, different people as they, it's, it's timely at the beginning of a new year. A lot of people are kind of reevaluating. Um, setting goals and expectations within their organization. So um, very, very appropriate. Thank you very much. Um, also would love to, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, just one last thing I wanna say, which is that 
Um, if anybody ever wants to discuss the issues of their actual organization or, or project that they're working on, I'm always happy to do that. So my door is open. That's great. Um, and then also a quick plug for the next one of these here, I'll put it in the chat. There's a registration link to the next um, All Hands on Deck webinar, February 3rd. For, well, first next week, next Wednesday, for any prospective students for the hybrid MSC program, we have an alumni panel of hybrid students uh, talking next Wednesday. And then two weeks from today, uh, Professor Michelle Shoemate is going to be talking to us about first impressions, sharing some uh, first impression research to help us understand kind of what we're measuring engaging when we uh, when somebody makes a first impression on us. And then a byproduct of that is, is uh, the ability to be strategic in making first impressions when you meet other people. So um, another terrific talk and, and it will be highly engaging as well. So hope to see everybody in a couple weeks. In the meantime, uh, thank you for joining and have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you guys.